After taking Peekles out in the field in Northumberland, we've transported the things magically back to Stirling University, where we are now, and we are in the pollen prep lab. What we're looking to do here is prepare the peat. We've got the base core. This is relatively interesting, so we'll have a look at this one first. And what we haven't spent time looking at because because our stuff is higher, the stuff that Danny will show you in a minute. Yes. This, this is very abrupt. Now where mm -hmm. the in, where the glaciation stopped and uh. and the interglacial started is quite I don't know. That's probably Looks like it there. there no? Yeah. So maybe there, that's the point yes. at which the thing changed. Yes. And we know from looking at the Greenland ice core stuff like that yes. that the change between that and that mm -hmm. took less than a decade. Mm -hmm. And in terms of temperature, that's about a six to eight degree centigrade rise in yeah. maybe in just five years. That's why climate people worry about what Yes. Because it's next. very sudden. These yeah. things are very, very sudden and yes. you can't you can't predict them either. So we have this clay down here and that's forming in a very cold climate at the end of the last glaciation. It's composed of clay and silt and sand. It's that colour because there's no organic matter in it. And there's no organic matter in it because there's almost nothing growing around or in the lake at this time. As you move up through the core, you change quite abruptly into something which does have bits of peat, bits of plant material in it. So something has changed in the lake. And that something is probably a climate change from very cold to very warm here at the start of the present interglacial. Moving further up, we can see fluctuations in organic matter, so the lake is not entirely stable. It re responds to external changes. And then the real big surprise here is this lovely cream white coloured material. This is something called marl. Marl is a precipitate, which means it precipitates calcium carbonate, which is in the water, and it makes crystals out of them. And sometimes, in fact quite often, there are small snails and they're absorbing calcium carbonate and their shells are growing. So this again probably represents a climate change. And this marl is forming in a very warm climate with clear blue lake waters. And here is where the lake ends, it dies. And here, over about five or six centimetres, you can see changes. Sometimes the marl is growing strongly, sometimes there's peat forming, and there are little layers showing that there's a battle, perhaps over years, between the natural lake sediment and what should be, what is being laid down here. And this black stuff, of course, is peat. The water level has dropped, and we have a peat bog. So again, Maybe climate change, maybe a drier climate. No water in the lake, and the whole of the lake simply turns into a peat bog. And that peat bog is the one that has lasted for perhaps the last 8,000 years or so. What we'll do, be doing in here is treating the peat with various chemicals in order to clean and prepare the pollen. Um, and this is the core that I've subsampled already in order to extract pollen and count pollen to do our analysis. This section essentially spans the Mesolithic to the start of the Neolithic. Okay, so as you can see, unlike the previous one, which has a nice variation in colour. This one, especially once it's oxidised slightly, has almost no variation. It's dark brown, black, all the way up. This bit at this end here, we have the areas where I've subsampled, and you can see the little grooves where I've taken peat out using a scalpel. The thickness is around about two millimetres for each subsample, no more than that, and at this point from 150 centimetres to um, 125 centimetres, which is around about here. The subsamples have been taken every centimetre. 
each of these subsamples is on the order of around about 20 to 30 years. The Mesolithic and Neolithic boundary is at around about uh, 130, 140 centimetres, which is sort of two thirds of the way up through this part. So to prepare this for subsampling is exactly the same as we were doing here, just to look at it. Yeah. You scrape across, and that's to avoid any contamination. You look at your meter rule, you, and then you cut straight across like that. Take out the peat mm -hmm. and place it into the test tubes there. Mm -hmm. Line it up against one of the actual centimetre points, mm -hmm. and then slide to one side. It's going to be something like... That's a bit wide, actually. You're aiming to get around about two millimetres worth like that. You have to dig down. Right, if you look at it, you'll find that that's quite thin. That's probably yeah. about a millimetre or something. And all you're doing is popping that straight into the tube. OK. Should be able to read off the scale at the same time. Oh. Well, that's just about right then, because it started off on three. And I'd normally aim to get a millimetre's worth of peat measured by volume like that. In here is uh, a two millimeter thick subsample for, of peat from 188 centimeters below the surface of the bog. But within this is the stuff we're after. In this is pollen and within this uh, four milliliter subsample Including the, including the liquid, will be hundreds of thousands of grains of pollen. We can't look at that as it is because it's simply too dispersed and there's too much um, other material, peat material, vegetation and sediment for us to be able to easily see the pollen. Um, so what we have to do is mix it up, as I was doing with the little stirrer here, and then treat it with various chemicals in order to get rid of some of the extraneous material and leave us with a much more concentrated sample of pollen. We do a process called acetolysis which actually involves concentrated sulfuric acid and acetic anhydride which removes any organic material that's remained in the pollen and makes it much easier to um, look at under the microscope. Once we've done that, um, what you're left with is a subsample of about this um, volume, okay, much, much smaller than what we started out with. And this is concentrated pollen, and this is pollen in a form we can actually look at it and count it much more readily. And exactly how much you end up with is somewhat dependent on the amount you start off with but as you can see in all these ones uh, this is quite what's called polyniferous there's a lot of pollen in it so we've ended up with quite large some samples if for example these are all obviously from the peat if for example we were to look and do the same thing with this material here the uh, late glacial clay where there's very little vegetation going around the sites what we'd probably end up with is something that looks a little bit like that, I, there's virtually no pollen in it. You get various chemicals, you put it into the test tube, you mix it up, um, you put it in the centrifuge and you tip the stuff out. For this particular initial process you'd spin it at 3000 uh, RPM and I'd probably put it on for five minutes. Um, that, what happens there is it allows time for the peat that's mixed up in that fluid to sink to the bottom. There's an awful lot of sedges, a lot of cyclorace. And you can see when it comes out, the stuff's magically vanished. This is quite good, it doesn't actually take very long, but you can still see within this, you can see some little bits of peat because they've not actually been forced down. But essentially, it's been whirled around until any particular matter in here has been forced to the base. I expect that liquid will just tip off and you're left with the rest of it there. What we've got under this slide 
is some material that's just come from Embleton's bog. And Danny's processed it, like he showed you upstairs. And what we have now is the finished product, if you like. This little bit of gunge here is picked up with a spatula and dropped on a microscope slide. And then we put a cover slip on top so it, keep, it keeps it dry. And now the trick is to work out what the pollen grains are and to count hundreds of pollen grains of different types to work out what the plants were. We try and get rid of the peat by this process of called acetolysis, uh, where we effectively the chemicals melt and the it's peat. Yeah. The pollen grains aren't made of the and same material that yeah. peat is, and so they survive. Mm. So, and what you've got there is a load of rubbish, so but in the middle is a grain of birch. So what you have to do is to learn all these types, <laughs> and then you count them, the and you count really hundreds right. of them. You're actually looking Probably at a, a pollen grain in three dimensions. It's not a slice. It's so small that you've got the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is... It's probably just a piece of probably, algae. That's not worth it, that um, one. But you can focus sort of that's up and down through the, yeah. through the pollen the grain spores. itself. So you can actually look, spores, for, yeah. look through the top and you focus and then in the middle in the, and then you go down middle. to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And all the time you're counting from top to middle and bottom. You're There's thinking, OK, how many, how many pollen grains am I seeing like here? Or how many bits of pollen grains? Mm -hmm. So. These things have uh, just below three on top and one underneath, mm -hmm. so there's four, there's four grains. Yeah, pollen grain from and the then you can go through and they change. Which, uh, yes. uh, like these are pollen grains of, sort of an oats what Danny was talking about yeah. upstairs. Mm -hmm. these, yeah. Yeah. The one this is the sedge group. The, okay. the, the thing that puts a lot of people off so is looking at the actual pollen diagram yeah. itself. We produce a pollen diagram, which I have here, that shows us in graphical form how the changes take place. This is called a pollen percentage diagram and what we have is a series of percentages for different taxa, for different plant uh, groups and different plant species. The way to read these things is, to, first of all you have to learn Latin, which is annoying, but yeah. that's alder, well, yes. and that's birch, yes. and that's oak, yes. and that's elm. And the oldest thing is down here, yeah. and you're going up which in many ways through a sequence that starts maybe six and a half thousand years ago, <laughs> and finishes five and a half thousand years ago. So you're looking at the changes in the woodlands. And what we have is the changing taxa as we go uh, through the depths from around about 150 to about 108 centimetres, which is as we viewed behind us here. At the very base, we've got um, a, an oak, an older woodland across here with some sedges. These are going to be surrounding the core site itself and some grasses as well. Now, at this point, this probably means it's a more or less um, untouched, as it were, forest. We also have a lot of sedge, a lot of cyperaceae. Now, those are going to be on the bog exclusively because these don't travel very far. Tree pollen travels a long distances, so may have come from a further field than herb uh, pollen. And that means that dominating the bog were sedges and possibly with some grasses, some poaceae. In the second zone, we've got an increase in older. Now that tells us that woodland, such as it was, actually became thicker. The canopy was closing in. We've got an increase both in older and slightly in, in oak. This is a percentage diagram, which basically means that if something goes yeah, up, something else has to come down, okay? Because yeah. it can only be 100%. Mm -hmm. So Various when you look for a reason why Alder increases here, you basically run your eye along to the different types of graph and try and find what's lost, what's been reduced. And, you, and the biggest loser for alder coming up is this thing called cyperaceae again, these sedges. So the sedges are going down, maybe because alder is increasing. And alder likes wet ground, so it's probably growing on the site itself. So, so Right. Here is a tree that's Buildings, shedding its pollen like pretty much vertically much down on the ground and it's replacing uh, sedges and sedges themselves are growing on the peat as well. Mm -hmm. So you have something happening on the bog itself. If you then start to work out that some, some trees here won't grow on wet ground or on peat. Things like oak and elm have to grow on dry soils. So they're telling you about a different part.
of the landscape. You have the the wetland trees and the wetland plants, and then looking away from the bog, you see these things on the slopes. One of the key things for us is at about um, 140 centimetres, just there, where elm suddenly declines. Now, this is a well-known and commonly seen feature throughout the British Isles. This is elm. Yes. And if we start down the bottom, we find that elm is not abundant. It's about 5%. And it increases slightly here, but at yeah, that point, yeah. it, dis it almost disappears. Yeah. All the way yeah. after that, yeah. there's nothing. Yeah. People have been trying to explain why elm dies at that point for something like 80 odd years. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And all the ideas keep going round and round in circles, and people just yeah. try and get more so information. The, the problem is, for us, what. Not what you have at least. No. <laughs> as our present interglacial warms up, we kind of expect to see that trees are coming into an area, into a region, and establishing themselves. Mm -hmm. And you, you expect birch to arrive, and then hazel, and oak and elm will arrive. Yeah. Alder's the last thing to arrive, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a shock to find that a tree dies out, effectively. We're used to thinking that woodlands get more and more complex, and they have more trees. This is the first time um, in the present interglacial where a tree actually start, yeah. starts to reduce its population. Most people think that here, elm trees have died out all over northwest Europe. So we, could, so we can date that to about 3800 BC. So it's in the early Neolithic. Yes. So it's 5,800 years ago. One of the arguments for elm's disappearance has to do with the fact that it occupies really quite fertile ground which would be very suitable for farming and one of the arguments is that um, it is the start of Neolithic uh, farming. It becomes less wooded, more open. Um, whether or not this is due to people or not is um, uncertain but there are as well as a decline in tree pollen grains um, an increase um, in the prevalence of cereal pollen grains, which are very easily identifiable. And in particular, we've got a thing called Avena triticum group, which is wheat, um, includes wheat, which may well be farming practices going around there. And they appear towards the upper levels of this particular diagram.